to order the committee of the whole meeting for Tuesday, October 15th, 2020. Wait a minute, 2020. I guess it's 2019. <laughs> Britain is 2020 on my agenda sheet. I just read it. We're early. I looked down at it to read it. We just leaped a year. Sorry. Yeah. Gave enough advance notice. <laughs> how, how did I get one? Yeah, they, they say 2020. They say 2020. <laughs> we I apologize. It's 2019. Um, first item on the agenda is roll call. Miller? Here. Rosado? Here. Beck? Here. Knopf? Chanzit? Here. Salvati? Here. Wolf? Here. O'Brien. Callahan. Here. Meitzler. Here. Malay. Ewer. Here. Cerrone. Here. And McFadden. Okay. We have the necessary quorum for tonight's nice conduct business. Uh, <coughs> second on the agenda is a reminder to please speak into the microphone for BATV. Um, if you're up using the microphone, you can adjust it to your height and make sure you speak into it. Um, next up would be approval of minutes for September 10th, 2019, September 17th, 2019, and September 24th, 2019. Anybody have any comments, corrections? Someone care to make a motion? So moved. Second. second. Uh, motion by Chancet, second by Silvati. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, next up would be items to be removed, added, or changed. No. Do we have anything more? Anybody else? Okay. Moving right on then to item number five, matters from the public for anything not on the agenda. Come on up, just give us your name and have at it. Okay. Good evening. My name is Bob McQuillan, and I reside at 465 Walcott Lane in uh, Batavia. Um, several weeks ago, I was uh, reading through uh, what everyone knows as the only truth and fact-finding thing we can use today is Facebook. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a comment about um, Batavia trying to develop a logo and the troubles and issues that um, the city council had gone through on doing that. And um, I'm going to read you my response to it and see if it might be a solution, potentially. Since, a little sarcastic to start. <laughs> Since the professionals can't get it right, why not hold a citywide contest open to any Batavia resident? Logos need to be submitted by December 1st, which probably isn't okay by now. Place them at the Batavia Library from 12.5 to 12.39, and residents can select their favorite. Highest voter, vote getter wins and receives, again, just my idea, a $1,000 reward and lights the 2020 Christmas tree. A plaque is hung at the library or city hall with the logo and photos of the winner, it becomes the resident's decision and not 15 members of city council. I'm sure that there are plenty of creative Batavia residents who would do an excellent job. Also, each of the schools could submit one group logo and prize money would go to the school. This could be open to any community group and used as a fundraiser for that group. You could make the whole project fun and truly a community-wide event. Um, I think that kind of solves the marketing, so to speak, problem that we have on developing a logo. It does truly make it a community-wide event. Um, and maybe some people will forget the money that has been sent, spent in trying to develop the current or potential logo that hasn't been approved. So um, I would ask that the committee consider the idea and potentially maybe someone could put it on the agenda for a city council meeting and that maybe it could be voted on by the city council and then the dates and those things could be worked out um, and also any prize money or any other things that you would want to be given to the, uh, the winner of the logo. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Bob. Something to think about. 
Okay, next up would be the consent agenda, which reads as follows. Um, item A, Committee of uh, the Whole Executive Session Minutes for September 17th, 2019. And B, Ordinance 1971, Annexing and Zoning 1340 and 1414 North Washington Avenue and 1341 Orion Road. Anybody have any comments with that? Not, I'll make the motion that we approve the consent agenda as read. Second. Motion by Wolf, seconded by Chansit. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, next up will be uh, Ordinance 1969, amending Title IV of the City Code related to body art establishments. Alderman Callahan, you want to take that? Yeah, so the first part of this was the ordinance regarding the city code related to the number, and that was government services, but we're just going to throw both of these under um, for the conditional use for the one that is out there. Um, the draft ordinance for 19-69 did come about because we have two, uh, we have limitations on two tattoo businesses in town, one of them being... Um, a thin line and the other one is was considered the microblading which fell under the licensing for town and um, it went back to the planning and zoning and they came back with recommendations to increase it by a vote I think it was unanimous seven to zero Joel do you want to take the number ordinance oh yes um, as the alderman mentioned Ordinance 19-69 would amend the city would amend the city code to allow um, up to three tattoo or body art establishments in the in the uh, downtown mixed use district. Committee had already discussed that and indicated a willingness to consider doing that. Uh, the second ordinance in front of you this evening is for a particular tattoo parlor in the downtown mixed use district at 127 uh, State Street. Uh, I think it's labeled incorrectly on the memo, I apologize for that, but it's 127 State Street. Uh, Plan Commission did hold a public hearing. There were, uh, aside from the applicant for the um, tattoo establishment who is here this evening, uh, there were no, uh, nobody addressed the commission. The commission did reach positive uh, findings as included in the, in the draft ordinance. The plan commission did include a number of recommended conditions of approval that relate to allowances and restrictions, operational allowances and restrictions. And by a vote of seven to zero, the plan commission recommended approval of the conditional use. Uh, the ordinance is drafted uh, to include the recommended conditions by the plan commission and staff recommends approval of ordinances 19-69 and 19-70 as presented. Does anyone have any thoughts on this? I'm okay with it. Scott? I, have, I just have a technical question <laughs> about timing. Um, there, there's a note in here, it says any procedure started before 10 o'clock needs to be done by 11. But I know tattoos, depending on how complex, they can take a long time. How does that, how would you fall into compliance with someone that started at like 9.45 and wanted a sleeve? If well, you want to come up, the that'd be awesome. can explain that, I believe. Yeah. From a code standpoint, it would be allowed. Uh, Mr. Nelson is here this evening. He can explain how he might sure. do that operationally. Richard Nelson, 312 South Van Buren Street. Um, pretty much just don't take anything that's going to take over an hour. <laughs> that's why appointments are made, you know? That's why I've been doing this 27 years, so I can more or less tell you how long someone's going to take me. Sure. Unless, of course, somebody comes sick or passes out or yeah. something where, where it becomes a slower process than that. Obviously, I can't tell the future that way, but I can right. tell you how long it's supposed to take me to yeah. do a tattoo. Okay. So... So my thoughts on this are um, approaching it from an economic incentive side of it and doing some of the background on it. This is a generational issue, pure and simple, um, because any other business 
we would be, nope, makes sense. The reason it's a generational issue is uh, for the revenue projections nationwide for 2019 for tattooing is a $2 billion industry. The annual growth from 2014 to 2019 annualized has been 6.1%. The Wall Street Journal projects 7.7% annualized return over the next decade. And the reason for that is 47% of millennials have at least one tattoo and 37% have two. Gen X, 36% have one, 24% have two. On the 50, 50 plus side, boomers, 87% have none. And 70 and older, 90% have none. But then you have to look at the economic growth in that in this business just like any other business and the boomer generation peaked in 1999 the gen x population peaked last year mm. what? <laughs> <laughs> but in 2028 there will be more gen xers than boomers for the first time ever nice. so no more jan brady for us <laughs> the fine peak yeah. <laughs> the amount, the number will be more than exactly. boomers. <laughs> yes. You peaked the 20 years. Oh, I peaked a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but going to that is to far as who's getting them and the revenue that's going in and why it's going to grow. Millennials will be above or overtake the boomer generation this year, if they haven't already, just in numbers. Mm. They do not peak in numbers with their growth and immigration growth until 2036. That there will be more millennials in 2050 than there are boomers today. So you kind of have to look at it as it's a growth industry. It might not be what you want, but generationally, the money is going to be there to support. And if people change their minds, because also another growth industry is tattoo removal. <laughs> <laughs> If people are allowed to make their own decisions, people will decide. And based on the numbers, um, I say at least three and probably more. Let the market decide. Dan? Oh, now, I'm, now I'm curious, who in here has a tattoo? I'm not saying. Anybody? I got one on the first 50, and I'm sure I'm going to have more by the time I'm turned 60. You're the growth industry. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Marty? Um, I've never been in one, so that answers that question. And even in the <laughs> store, um, do you sell re removable ones? <laughs> um, Hannah. <laughs> no, my question is, is, is there, is it 100% service or is there any retail sales come out of your store? Um, there might be retail as far as t-shirts. Gotcha. Uh, stuff like that, you know, marketing like that way as far as with the name of the shop and stuff like that goes. Um, but there will be piercing and tattoos, so obviously there will also be sales of jewelry. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's a good point, that if somebody wanted to put some retail in there, mm -hmm. I believe the, the amount of stores in the last five years has gone up from about 13,000 to 21,000 and it's expected to keep on growing so somebody that would also incorporate more customers that want the reason why it's expanding is they're targeting the millennial and the gen x market who are wanting the experience i believe you know that from your trip to canada everything's about the experience so the more a business caters to diverse opportunities of sale they should be able to clean up because the money's coming in the door I guess I would just say, I mean, it, Mr. Nelson's obviously been in Batavia for a number of years. If he thinks he's going to be successful opening up another business in our downtown, kudos. Let's, Thank you. I don't see why we would restrict that. Mark? Yeah, I mean, to that point, um, we have multiple places that sell uh, burritos and tacos. And <laughs> they're all successful, or they appear to be successful. They're still mm -hmm. open. So it's... It's up to the business owner to decide whether or not it's a good place to put a business in. If you think it's the right place to go, then I don't have a problem with it. And when I was going for my second tattoo, I went to go to a thin line, <laughs> couldn't do it, so I had to take my business to North Aurora. 
I was just going to say, that, to your point, the market will decide. Um, there were a lot of Thai restaurants. Now there's less Thai restaurants. <laughs> we, if we need to, we're going to have to. So. Yeah. We need a burrito re removal store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really? And I can attest that Rich does a very good job. Okay. That's what's on my shoulder. Removes Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone else on committee have anything to say about it? I think it's good. Anyone from the public? Would anyone like to make an ordinance, 19-69, amending Title IV of the city code related to body art establishments? So moved. Second. second. Motion by Chancet, second by Salvati. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Okay. Next up will be. Does that come back Monday. This is yeah. yours is now. Yeah, that, that was just, that was <laughs> that the was legal the part of it. Yeah. Uh, oh, increased yeah. number of licenses. This now is yours. Right. Next one is Ordinance 19-70, granting a conditional use permit in the downtown mixed use district for a tattoo parlor, piercing studio at 127 State Street. Richard Nelson, applicant, classic tattoo. So as we have just approved to City Council, this will be the applicant for the conditional use for the third permit does any, anyone have any questions on this one so moved second does the applicant wish to say anything thank you <laughs> <laughs> <Voted yet. laughs> yeah and after we vote on this one thing to, to for you to know is to come to our city council meeting when we do the actual approval of these ordinances 21st and, right and then be prepared yes. to talk about the business you know your your website, your phone number, have all the information so that you can get it out. We'll be on TV as okay. well as we are tonight, but you'll also have that opportunity to get that out in front of the public. Okay. If you have a Thank thumb, you. if you have a thumb drive with some cool pictures, yeah, screen right behind us. Okay. And just so everybody also knows, you Thanks. are um, you've had several uh, campaigns for the semicolon for the past project. five years, yeah. yeah. And this council has been very committed to raising awareness for suicide awareness. So thank you for what you do on that end. I was able to meet Stephanie Weber, the president of Suicide Prevention. So uh, her and her daughter I met and became friends with them and learned about the semicolon through them. Mm. And thought, what a better way to give out to somebody, especially through the tattoo industry, where usually people look at it as bikers or something else you know especially <coughs> older than gen x and the the cost for all of that you donated to suicide yes prevention. every tattoo that i do during that month i proceed and give to suicide prevention at the end Very of the cool. month and how many times have you done that uh i have done it six times now the first year i did it twice uh and then after that i stuck to just doing it during december thank you for that mm -hmm. sure so we have a motion by Cerrone, a second by Ewer. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next up will be item number nine, authorizing sale of Georgetown Detention Pond property uh, by solicitation of bids. Alderman Chanzit. You can see, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just go ahead and turn this over to, uh, to Scott. Thank you. Um, as part of our efforts to dispose of what we consider excess properties, this is one of the parcels that uh, we found that um, is a little bit unusual in that it is surrounded on three sides by the Georgetown Homeowners Association properties in the unit one of this subdivision. Um, this is the only unit of all three units that actually doesn't own their detention pond. Uh, the city actually owns this pond, uh, but the association maintains it. Um, so after some discussion with them and, and the fact that uh, because it's city property, pretty much anybody could set up a picnic on somebody's back porch uh, <laughs> there, that uh, we felt that it would be appropriate to um, sell this property to them uh, as, as part of our efforts also to dispose of excess city properties. So uh, we had some discussions with them. Their board has agreed to accept the property if we uh, put it up for sale. And so this would be the first step in a multi-step process to sell property like it usually takes us because we're a governmental entity and it's not easy to sell things. So uh, the, what we would be doing is after this is passed, uh, we then have to publish a notice in the newspaper three times and then open bids at a city council meeting 
uh, and then after that, then the city can decide to accept the, the award uh, bid. Uh, you do not have to accept the highest bid. Uh, so if somebody else decides they're going to bid on this, uh, you do not have to accept that. Presumably, the association will accept it, will submit a bid as part of the uh, efforts here. Uh, and then if that happens, then we would do a deed to the association and turn it over to them. According to your memo, we're not bound by um, a, a percentage or, or a dollar amount because there's no there's no appraisal. That's correct. Yes, it just takes a three quarters vote of the city council to approve the sale. That, that was my my question was if we had any idea what appraised value was, but right, no, we have. Yeah. So there's they're maintaining it now, so there's no SSA on that. Or, correct. Okay. So then there wouldn't be one to worry about. Correct. It, it, it's a homeowners association, so they have an HOA. Yeah. So this would be incorporated as part of the HOA and when they acquire it. Okay. Yeah, I know you've been dealing with the HOA president, Linda, over there, and she's spoken very highly of the process. So appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. No other questions, and I uh, would uh, move that we approve Ordinance 1972 authorizing the sale of Georgetown Detention. Uh, upon property by solicitation of bids. Second. second. Motion by Chanzit. Second by Weitzler. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up will be item number 10, resolution 19-103-R. Uh, Recommend award of a facade grant for 117 and a half and 119 South Batavia Avenue to Moser. Marty? Yeah, so this is the first time Anthony will be presenting something before us. Yes, so, of course. Of so course. I'm just going to let him <laughs> run with it. <laughs> Thank you, Marty. Very happy to be up here today. <clears throat> what we have in front of us today is um, an application for our facade improvement grant at 117 and a half and 119 South Batavia Avenue. Uh, resolution is 19-103-R, which is awarding this grant to Dan Moser, who's the property owner. So just a little bit of a background for this particular uh, grant. Um, basically what you'll find is the attached application and everything that you need in your packet. Um, so one of the things that we're going to be looking at is some of the work that's going to be done. So the subject grant um, will serve to complete the planned improvements to the exterior of the building, replacing two wood windows located in the rear of the building that face the parking lot. Um, then replacing the wood exterior door to the upstairs apartments located in the front of the building facing Route 31. The replacement of the two rear windows is what still makes this project eligible for the grant because it is facing uh, a public parking lot. Um, the proposed windows are wood with white aluminum cladding um, and various options are there. So you can take a look at that. Um, I don't know if the uh, if Dan is here in the audience. How you doing, Dan? Good. <laughs> this is my first time actually meeting Dan today, so but we've been we've been corresponding with each other, so um, happy to have you out here. Um, Dan, did you want to say anything to the project? Why don't you use the mic? Uh, Dan Moser, my home address is one six four seven eight West Willow Drive, I live in Spring Lake, Michigan. I'm a Gen X with one tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> but you haven't peaked yet. Yeah, I was looking at that. Um, no, no, thank you. That was uh, well read. Uh, so we're just looking to improve the building a little bit. Uh, it's kind of a you know chipping away at some of the things that need to be replaced. Uh, there's a front door that enters the building from the street level um, that's in bad shape, and we need to replace it. Uh, we, we presented in front of the historic commission. They approved uh, the uh, process to replace that door with a fiberglass door that's painted to the same color. Uh, the one uh, change or correction to uh, what was described, we're gonna, there will be aluminum wrapped wood windows on the back. They will be brown. That was a, a little, I had submitted the application initially when it was going to be white, but after some discussion in the, in the historic commission meeting, it was requested that we go brown, which is fine with us. Uh, we're just looking to improve the energy efficiency of the building and give it a little bit of a face, facelift. Does anyone have any questions? Anyone from the public? 
Would anyone like to make a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Chanzit. Second by Meitzler. There it is. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, next item is number 11, uh, resolution 19-110-R, awarding a grant under the Gateway Improvement Program to Batavia Buildings, LLC, or 9 and 3 to 15 South Batavia Avenue. Alderman Callahan. I will let Anthony continue. So, Marty, it looks like I'm two for two. You see me two times tonight. I know. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in front of you all, uh, you'll have the uh, attached proposed resolution 19-119R, which is awarding a city gateway improvement program uh, matching grant uh, for the purposes of providing financial assistance to the uh, Batavia Buildings LLC. We do have the uh, owner here, uh, Michael Marconi. Um, what he is trying to do is... Uh, work with our hardscape improvement. So basically what he'll be doing is repairing and um, providing some resurfacing of a private parking lot. Um, this would include access and internal drive aisles serving the commercial buildings located at 9 and 3, uh, 15 South Batavia Avenue. Uh, again, this is in your packet, so you can have an opportunity to look at that. Um, with this hardscape improvement, we're looking at a total of amount for this project to be $24,763. Now, uh, Michael Marconi qualifies for the maximum grant uh, with this uh, GIP award of $10,000. Um, Michael, I don't know if you want to come up and speak to this or... Okay. Hi, Michael Marconi, one on 605 Turnberry Lane in Winfield. So this is part of us trying to finish up the project that we started over a year ago at the Gammon Corners house. Um, we've painted the house, we've replaced all of the bad wood, we've tried to finish re-landscaping the house, and now we are not really just repairing the, the driveway aisles and aisles, but we are replacing them. So this would be the, the final end of that project, and then after that, we just have some more painting to do of the fence out front, and that's about it. And we're trying to restore that house to look like, you know, my dad wanted it to look several years ago. But it fell into a state of disrepair, we think. I guess some people might question, you know, is this part of the intent? And for me, I did look at it as it was because it is a gateway into our downtown. The house does look absolutely fantastic right now, all redone. As you look at it and you're like, that is new, and <laughs> it looks... I don't have a thunder. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but it does. It looks great. So um, my when we decided <clears throat> to use this money that had been sitting for at least 10 years um, on, a, on those things for which it was designed, uh, this qualifies in my mind. The painting, the painting of the house which we did over a two-year period was over $110,000, which I still, I still have the articles that my dad was quoted in when he said, God, we spent $30,000 to paint this house. This was several years ago when it won the Painted Lady Award. And then he would say $30,000 was more than the house cost to build. So with the completion of this project and the landscaping we've done, and then next season we're going to paint the coach house, we'll have spent probably close to $180,000 restoring this house. And it's an important corner. We love it. I have one question. Allie. Um, the parking lot or the, the paved space that's along the, be the north side of it, the one that dead ends does not go out to 31, is that going back in? Are you going to pave that section back over? Or are you going to remove any of that? I'm glad you brought that up because it would be my opinion that we remove some of it. I don't know how you feel about that, but I, I think... That's we're, what I was going to ask, is if you wanted been, to do that. We've been talking about it, and I sense that that was put in when it was a funeral home. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when the funeral home had automobiles that pulled all the way up. Right. But it would be my goal, um, again, I don't have a thumb drive or a picture, <laughs> but 
when we're done, we could all get a tattoo of the gamut house. <laughs> <laughs> right across the back. <laughs> Gums. Get their um, before nine. <laughs> be, what I would like to do, if I could, is I'd like to stop the driveway sort of where if it, the house has, um, I have an over, here, I have a picture here. It's in the packet. Yeah, it's in the yeah, packet. Yeah, I've got it pulled up on my computer. I don't know if we can yeah. get it on up on the screen. Yeah. Anthony can pull it out of there. I guess my thought there was is if there was a way to get rid of the, to me, unused hardscape that's out <clears> in front of that from the that that side, it would provide a much better view from the street or anywhere, driving, walking by. What what I would what I would want to do if I could is so there's a walkway that wraps around the house to right here. We were trying to think what the natural place to end this driveway would be. Would it be right here and then do away with all of this? Mm. Or would you do it closer up here? I'm, it doesn't matter to me. The only thing that I need to keep, I mean, we have a lift there mm -hmm. that's right about here and, and the doorway that's right about here. So, I mean, it could come back as far as here um, or right here. But we're definitely open to it. I don't, I don't see the need for all of this. And in fact, the, the bid includes all of this. So what we would do is maybe lessen the bid a little bit, but then increase a bid with a landscaper to, to um, plant grass there. Because yeah. what, the, what the intent is of what these gentlemen are, are planning on doing is they're milling out up to three inches of the lot. So in that area, we'd have them mill out all of the lot, mm -hmm. level it, and then just give us an area where we could, you know, have the landscapers probably not till next spring right. bring in dirt and sod and mm -hmm. just replant grass there and i think it'd look a lot better I, it doesn't need to, I, that driveway doesn't need to be there right anymore. and that's what i was going to my point was i was going to ask that if you're not you're planning to use that for anything i think that would make a big improvement to the the street frontage of that yeah. not to have that empty piece of blacktop that's there that never gets it, used. The, the only thing that, I mean, I remember back um, when my dad and my stepmom had a, did a lot of that, the sidewalk sales, that's where the tent would be. <laughs> yeah. It'd be fine on grass, though, so yeah. no one would mind. But So it would be my intent to get rid of it, and if you made that a condition to doing this, I'd, I, I would depending certainly on cost. Yeah. Sorry, I would, I would certainly support you know removing as much of that as you could. I mean, to me, want to, yeah. more impervious makes no sense there. I mean, pull right. it back, let the green, let the greenscape be. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it would improve that corner a lot. I'm totally in agreement and open to doing that. Mm. Okay. Marty, would you care to make a motion? All in, or got to make a motion first. Recommend approval to City Council Resolution 19-110-R, awarding Gateway Improvement Program grant funds to Batavia Buildings, LLC, property owner and associated grant application for said applicant in the amount of $10,000 or 50% of the project cost, whichever is lesser. Second. Motion by Callahan, second by Meitzler. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. And if you want to come and talk about what you're going to do out there at city council meeting, you're welcome to. What's that? If you'd like to come to our regular city council meeting and talk about what you're going to do out there, you can get that out to the rest of the public. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up is Ordinance 19-68, grant of a variance for front setbacks, 804 North Van Buren Street, Judd Lofke, TK Green Enterprises, LLC applicant. Alderman Callahan. As was stated, this is for variances at 804 North Van Buren. Um, Joel, do you want to go ahead and take this one and describe uh, what happened at the planning and zoning? Yes, thank you. Um, this ordinance would grant front setback variances for the existing home at 804 North Van Buren. Uh, granting of the variances would allow the property to be divided into two lots, a south lot for the existing home, and then a north lot that can be buildable, presumably for a future residence. Uh, there is enough lot area and width to support two properties uh, in the R1M zoning district, which this property is currently zoned. Um, if with um, with dividing the two properties, 
The south property, uh, currently the, the whole property has its front setback area on Lake Street, which is to the south. And it has its corner side setback area along Van Buren. When you divide the properties, the south lot would have its front setback area on Van Buren and its corner side setback area on Lake Street. The zoning code uh, stipulates that the narrower of the two street frontages on a corner lot is the front of the property. Currently, the way the whole property sits, the front <coughs> setback area for the whole property, again, is on Lake Street. The existing house and its front porch encroach into what would be the required front setback area for Van Buren Street. There is no construction, there is no change in the home proposed. Its relationship to Van Buren Street and Lake Street would not change with the variances. Um, but granting the variances would essentially allow the existing front setbacks on Van Buren to become legal with granting of the variances, and that would clear the way for the property to be divided as you can see it is proposed to be divided. Um, at the public hearing, one neighbor spoke in opposition to the variances. Uh, he also distributed two correspondences from neighbors that also were opposed to the variances and they were included in your packet. Um, the speaker himself, he identified that a tree on the property, uh, on, the, on the north property, which is along the frontage, mm -hmm. uh, would likely have to be removed if the property were to be developed with a home. He also noted that uh, for some time there has been uh, essentially a community garden that's located where the proposed north, north lot is, and obviously that would be gone if a new house were there. Uh, the zoning board reviewed the application and felt that the applicant who is here this evening had not demonstrated the hardship uh, to meet the related findings in the zoning code. The uh, zoning board did find in the affirmative for two of the five findings, and all the findings are noted in the, in the ordinance. Um, the, board, the zoning board did state that they felt the character of the neighborhood um, can be supported by having two houses on this property, and the board was not opposed to dividing the property. Uh, they just knew that they, their, their responsibility was not to vote on a lot split, but it was to make a recommendation on the variances. Uh, since they could not find in the affirmative for all five of the variances, the zoning board um, failed to recommend approval for the two variances. Um, the Committee of the Whole this evening um, can take action on the ordinance as presented or with uh, specific amendments as you may direct to staff. Uh, staff does note that Ordinance 19-68 uh, is drafted to note how the board felt about the lot split um, as opposed to just focusing on the variances themselves, although the ordinance, the ordinance would approve the two variances. The City Council can uh, look at things beyond what the findings in the zoning code uh, specifies whereas the zoning board has to stick to the findings. Um, a city council approval of this, of the variances that received a negative recommendation from the zoning board would require a two thirds majority vote. Uh, council, the committee is not bound to that majority. It can just take any, any num uh, a simple majority can be a recommendation for approval. Uh, staff recommends that the Committee of the Whole recommend approval of Ordinance 19-68. Uh, this does include a number of um, conditions of approval as recommended by the Zoning Board that relate to planting of parkway trees and uh, issuing, having a building permit issued for an existing deck on the, on the home that, was, that never received a building permit. Uh, and that's it. Anyone have any, Scott? I guess the question more to the applicant, um, what would be your intentions for both lots? Obviously the south lot has a home on it. Um, would that house be rehabbed or would there be work done that? And then what would be your intentions for the north lot? I'm assuming to split it. If you want to split it, you eventually want to build on it. 
Right. Uh, first of all, good evening. My name is Tonya Kour. I live at 2848 Reserve Court in Aurora. Um, first, thank you. Um, I was a public servant for six years as, on the DuPage County Board, so I know what it takes time away from your family, so thank you for that. Um, to your question, we invested in this property. You know, I ran for state rep, and I got to know Batavia very well. Love your city. I love your people. So we wanted to invest in Batavia. But when we invested in this property, we were under the understanding that we could split the lots and build another home on the north lot. And that is what our intention is to do, not in the next year or two, but eventually that's what we would like to do. Um, leave the existing home how it is and build a brand new 1,500 square foot house on the other lot. Um, we have two options with this property, again, because we wanted to invest in Batavia and we want to continue to invest in Batavia. We would prefer what I just mentioned, leave the existing home. If obviously, if there's repairs that need to be done, we'll do it. And then build a new house um, that would fit the character of the neighborhood with these two lots. That's what we would prefer to do. Um, the other option is expanding on the current house and making a bigger house. That is not what we prefer to do. We prefer to have two different houses, a brand new house, because it would fit better with a neighborhood character with a neighborhood. Does anyone else have any questions? I have one, and this will go back probably to Joel. Um, as I read through this and just kind of mulled this over, thinking about what could be done there, or how you could do this, um, if there was a subdivision of the first lot, the one with the original house on it, to make the frontage on Lake Street narrower, if you made, say, 13 feet off the lot to then uh, be the east side of that property, could then the one lot be considered in the front setback of the house stay on Lake Street? Um, Even though the two parcels would be owned by the same person, you'd have a separate parcel. I'm, I'm trying to follow what you were... Take this section of the lot and make it a separate parcel. So then this becomes the short side of the lot for the original house that's there. I know um, that that's probably way outside it, the box, it, it, but... It's, it's a little... Like it is a... It, <laughs> it's a technicality, but you're absolutely right. It's a technicality, right. but it would yeah, solve the I problem. Like it. Right. right. It, it, it is, and... I guess that, that that is an option. We would need to make sure that um, that that some of the property can be split. Who would own it if it's held in common ownership with the house that's on the south parcel? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can't exist if you split it the way you suggest. It can't exist as its own buildable lot. So why is it there? <laughs> we would need to re review that carefully and. Um, also, there is a deck on the back of the house. We would need to make sure that any lot split that you, that, that, as you right. suggested, would allow that house to observe all of its required right. setbacks it, on the newly configured lot for that house. I know it's way outside the box, but that was just one thought right. that I had. Other, other than that, Scott? One other thing is that it probably wouldn't meet the minimum lot size. We're size, really okay. close to the minimums sure. on both of these lots, okay. so it probably wouldn't actually meet Okay. Those. That was the only thought that I had about it. Nick. I just had a question about the, the, the community garden and how that works because I'd, if they're allowing that now, I'd hate to see somebody be penalized for giving up land and being good stewards to the community. Now they're going to be have that held against them as a defense of why we shouldn't do this. So well, is if that they own still the property, there? they can do whatever they want with it. I know that. And that's <laughs> why it sounded odd that that was uh, kind of being held against them. Like, oh, we don't want this done by the neighbors. Right. We was it, was this it a community done. garden before you bought the property? Or has it been since you brought the property? No, or both? it was before we bought the property. And we've let them continue. We've allowed them to continue to use it. I got some wonderful tomatoes, actually, <laughs> this summer. And again, it'll be there next summer as well. Again, we're not looking to build on this in the next few years but thank you for pointing that out because it is our property and we're allowing our our neighbors we want to be neighborly so we're allowing them to continue to use it Abby you think you'll be able to build a, a, a neighborhood uh, appropriate house there without removing that big tree that everybody was writing about so do you have an answer on this Infamous tree. The, the, the tree was mentioned many times. The I, I will tell you this, though. Our goal is to keep in character with the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I love Batavia, and I want to 
keep it that way. I mean, the, uh, the tree is like right next to the right of the sidewalk, so I don't, uh, I think, the, right I think we determined the front setback, it would have to, the house would be way past it anyway, so um, I don't think, I don't see that being a problem at all. Okay. Yeah. And, so that, and that neighborhood is, I mean, in terms of style, you know that it's it's been re i mean there's some teardowns and rebuilds in there so it's kind of an eclectic sort of mm -hmm. mishmash of homes in there so a new home would would fit right in i mean provided it's done tastefully but yeah it, i think it would be fine and the setbacks are pretty steep so it can't be that big of a house right in affordable house does anybody from the public wish to speak I guess my thinking along the line of the tree when I was kind of reading that was the same thing with the garden. It's on their property. It's their tree. Even if the property isn't subdivided, the tree can go down. The tree can go down at any point because they own the tree. Now, if it was subdivided and you wanted the tree there, that would probably be a better selling point in the long run. I know when we bought our house, had a huge tree. But those emerald ash borers got it, and it's gone. And now we've got another one back, so it's, it's hard when there's a large tree that you don't want to go, um, but you try to figure out what you can best do with your property. Joel, do you have anything else on this? No. No, I think covered everything. Does anybody have... I don't, I don't know a question, just, just a comment. I, I would think as the, as the economy is picking up or as um, more investment and interest is happening um, in the downtown and blocks nearby the downtown, I imagine we're going to see more opportunities like this. And even though this does not fit in with our ordinances, this feels like a step in the right direction. It feels like an improvement for this neighborhood, and I would want to support that type of an investment here. I think I would also, the only thing that I'm a little... Um, dismayed or just the two aldermen from that ward were not here and i know um alderman not did reach out to me that he was opposed to it um and i think it is because of some of the concerns mm -hmm. that the neighbors do have so um i thought maybe some more people would have shown up tonight mark um yeah i guess my only concern really is that if you look at all the lots in that area they're all large lots um so we go down a path of mm -hmm. all these corner lots starting to subdivide, and I don't know if that—I don't know if that's what I want. I think that there's there's value in those larger lots. Um, if you look at uh, communities to the east of us, a lot of those communities have gone and they've had these larger lots, and those houses get torn down. And yes, the McMansion gets put up. I understand that's that's an option. I'm not opposed to that option necessarily. If people want to start building some large homes and and driving some more. Uh, more value into the downtown area. Our large homes are all out on the outskirts of town. Um, so that's my concern with it is it, it does get, I know you can build a house that's to the character of the neighborhood, but then it takes away from the character of the neighborhood if we start subdividing all of the lots in that neighborhood. I take a slightly different tact on that, that if you kind of look where we're going with population growth, we don't have much more land to go. So we have to start looking at some density and land lot sizes. So from there, it is in the downtown. You do want a more dense downtown to encourage the economic development of what we're trying to, what we've been doing in the downtown. Does that mean that tomorrow we say everybody subdivide and start cramming everything in? No. And I think it has to be done with purpose. And when you still, when I've gone out and looked at that lot too, can to reasonably fit in that match the it still do it does the lot size still does match the character of the neighborhood it's not that far off i think there are a couple little larger lots um as a whole but there still are a lot of small lots right. around there too and, and to your to your point you know <clears throat> that lot can be subdivided yeah, because most can't yeah, most can't. Right. Yeah, right, I'm because, you, because right. the house is, is to the end of the, of the lot where most are kind of more central. Right. So, so this is one of those unique situations where you can do it. So I, I understand your yeah. point. I understand no, your it, point. And I've been thinking about this all weekend long. I mean, yeah. Obviously, it's, I guess, it's a hard one for me, I'm going to yeah. be honest. Yeah, similarly, I've kind of gone back and forth on this one as I've read through it. I mean, I, I, we've had discussions about other lots that, you know, we've allowed 
variances or modifications, however you want to, you know, title it. Um, you know, we, where we were trying to put in more dense housing, uh, but that required adjustments to the setback and, and whatnot. So it's not unprecedented. Um, you know, the, the notion of the garden, I, I absolutely agree. I, I appreciate your neighborliness. Um, I, I know my family has taken part in that garden at one point, and, and it is fun. But at the end of the day, it is your property. And if, if you choose not to allow the garden there, that's your choice. Um, so I, that one didn't, yeah. Um, the tree, yeah, of course, I'd love to save it. But again, it, it, it's your property. If, if, you know, at some point, you know, if the tree dies and nobody gets their way. End of story on that one. Um, keeping in tune with the neighborhood, though, I think is pretty important, and, and certainly, um, you know, seeing some of the the neighbors object to dividing the the lot, you know, I, I can understand their their argument there. Um, so I, again, I just keep going back and forth on this one. But um, you know, here we saw as well that the zoning board, you know, they did not recommend by way of the way that the board, uh, excuse me, the the zoning code is written. So I. I do kind of need to keep that in mind as well. I I agree with that because that's where I keep going back and forth on this. Also weighing the private property rights versus the neighborhood and the character of it. And then you go to the O to seven vote of not being able to um, override that. That weighs because in the past when we've done setback variances, it's had the support of all of the neighbors. And that has made it much easier to say, all right, we get it, we understand it, That's we know there's, there's variances allowing us to do that. So it does make me a little concerned where you're trying to fully respect your rights as the property owners um, because you don't want to take a loss on a property. But then the neighbors are using that same argument. Well, we're using, we're losing the loss of our property because we expected this to never be developed. We didn't expect it to be developed. That's now that goes with you never know when you've got an empty lot next to you. You know. never know. Unless it's owned by the Forest Preserve. Like right. <laughs> or Fermi. <laughs> no, not even. So if you have any thoughts on that. So just to add a couple of things. Um, we all want to do the right thing. The, uh, the fellow who objected, uh, my clients bought the property. Um, the fellow who lived there had lived there for many years, and he was like disabled, so he was living on the first floor. And this was their retirement, and they wanted to move to Florida. And they really kind of overpaid for the property because he couldn't go up and down the stairs, and they were willing to do it. And we, we understand we were taking a chance. We, we came into this knowing what was going on. But um, I think they did this trying to do the right thing for that fella in the, he was in a wheelchair or whatever, a walker. Um, and the, the variances we're asking for are, you know, 2.69 feet and 2.13 feet. And they're very minimal. And at the zoning board, they technically voted seven to nothing against it because they had to because we couldn't meet the hardship. And we knew that going in. But six of the seven said, yeah, we're okay with splitting it. And we were there for a long time. <laughs> and we, they analyzed it and, and analyzed it. And there was one fellow who, the, the, the person who was against it was the guy next door saying that, well, it's going to block my view putting a house back there. Now, my clients are willing to sell it at a super reasonable price. If the community garden, the city wants to buy it, the city of Aurora, we buy property like, <laughs> it's ridiculous. We spend so much money, but... Um, <laughs> We are happy to sell it at a super reasonable price. We don't have to build a house. If he wants to buy it, if anybody else wants to buy it to keep the garden, absolutely no problem. Um, but I think that's important that the that six out of seven were, were for it, for, for splitting the lot. And um, because it's so minimal, I think it would be fair. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the one person spoke against it. That's, in Aurora, we'll have like 50 people speak against something if they don't want it. So. I guess I went back and forth on this and looked at it a couple different times since this was out. Um, I guess where I, I kind of fell at the end of this was it's another opportunity for a smaller lot, smaller house than if they tear down this and they build one big house. Mm -hmm. And that's an opportunity for two families to be in this town. Uh -huh. And I think that's something that kind of made me say, yes, I'm okay with this. 
is that if we provide housing that maybe isn't in town on a small lot, smaller size house, it makes it affordable for somebody that either lives here and wants to stay here or works here but can't afford to live in any other house, that there is a smaller available property for them. So I think this is something that we should vote for. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, I would come down on the side of supporting the applicant and what they're trying to do here. I do that because I've certainly got, obviously, some history up here. I grew up down the street here just a ways. But this neighborhood, immediately to the north of where we're talking about here, where Alderman Malay lives on that street, that was a uh, farm for many, many, many years. It was the Nagel farm, and it was always full of corn and backed right up to the cemetery on the, on the east side. And then, you know, we, ha we had a kind of a mixture of properties up there. We had some bigger houses, and then we had a lot of smaller houses. And in, in the early days of Batavia, this was kind of the area where new families, newly married people, bought the house and moved in and started a family and then maybe moved someplace else in town, but it was kind of that type of a neighborhood. Well, then when Nago decided he wanted to subdivide it, he put in all those nice new houses there, and uh, they've been a certain a nice addition to our town. But then as you look around, uh, there's about three or four lots within about a two or three block range of this house that are gonna need some further conversation about them and probably have many of the same concerns that the applicant has brought up as far as we're gonna to have to probably grant some side yard variances or something to get some good things done. Uh, we're probably gonna have a couple of them in our face here next year because they're, in, they're being abandoned or they're being foreclosed on or they're already abandoned and we got boarded up houses up there and they really look bad in a neighborhood that's really moving quite rapidly forward to have Two or three, at least two houses sitting up there that now are boarded up, and I, you know I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on the council to get that done. So what Tanya and her family are proposing to do here, I think, is right in line with what we as a community are trying to do, as far as trying to bring that whole thing around. And it's a golden opportunity because it's not like it's a bunch of bad stuff happening there now. It's just a matter of the us kind of adapting ourselves to our some minor variances to our building code to allow for this to happen. And I certainly subscribe to what Alderman Chanson just said as far as the, the, the ability of, you know, creating maybe some property where younger families can move in and you could have a couple more uh, nice houses up there. And certainly the school being right there is a major reason why people want to move in. And uh, it was, it's just an area that, you know, the, the whole drainage for the northeast side of Batavia used to be on that retention pond that's immediately to the south of Louise White School there. That was where all the, the drainage was. And at one point in time, back in the 1880s, the city built a limestone tunnel that went from that property down between Van Buren and Prairie to Spring Street and went over the dry, underneath the driveway of where former Alderman Brown grew up and went down and came down onto Washington Avenue about in the middle of the 100 block and went down to across the river here where, uh, well, it was uh, Pal Joey's until he moved out to Randall Road. And that was a big drainage ditch that used to, and we were still draining water out of there until we did all the River Street things and kind of shut some stuff off. But that, that drainage ditch that's there to, to the west or east of this property, Every now and then we get a call that part of it suddenly collapsed and we got a big hole in the ground in somebody's backyard there where things got limestone walls on it. I mean, it's the only ditch we know of in town that has it. Now, so I, I, I pay tribute here tonight to the old time Batavia history that this area represents because we have, I think, as a council, done a real nice job of trying to modernize and renovate and bring that neighborhood back and to see all the reinvestment and commit, commitment by younger families coming in there, I think it's a wondrous thing for the city to have. So I would encourage us to approve this. Anyone else? Mark? Scott. Scott. Uh, yeah, I would, one other thing I would note is that this is a unique situation because the variances are really applicable because of the house. And if the house wasn't there, they could still do the lot split and build two new homes that are compliant with the zoning code. So really all we're really looking at is the difference between the split and where the front yard is located. So keep that in mind as part of your decision that, you know, if, if, if they weren't granted the variance, they could come back and get a demolition permit, and knock, down, knock it down and build two new homes, essentially. So. Right. 
Mark? Yeah, so I guess um, I've said this before. One of the things I enjoy about um, our meetings is that I come in thinking one thing and, <laughs> and, and having thought about it all weekend and like going back and forth, but then come here and listen and hear perspectives I hadn't, that hadn't crossed my mind. So um, I'm leaning towards yes. Hmm. So before he changes his mind, <laughs> I reserve the right to get smarter. So. Yeah. Uh, I make a motion we approve to City Council Ordinance 19-68, grant a variance for front setbacks 804 North Van Buren Judlofke TK Green Enterprises LLC applicant. Second. Second. Motion by Callahan, second by Meitzler. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And it just needs 10. Well, there are three. From well, that doesn't matter here. At council, it needs At council. Ten. council. Correct. Council. There's, there's 10, ten here, here right now. But it, yeah. So if nobody changes, it goes through. Right. And, you know. If, Joe said he was going to be a no. Well, the other we, right. don't know, we don't know where O'Brien is, and we don't know where Malay is. Or Drew. Well, well, the two Utes are probably voting no. Two Utes. Yeah. The two Utes. The two what? <laughs> and we'll see what Joe has to say if but he do they has. have any tattoos? <laughs> Depends on where their prime of life, prime of life is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, next up. Welcome. Thank you. Next up will be uh, Resolution 19111-R, authorization to execute a contract for the 2019-2020 snow and ice removal services with Kozak Custom Landscaping Incorporated for the amount not to exceed $70,000. I know neither Gary or Scott could be here. Does anybody have any questions on this? This is for our downtown uh, services that we've been doing for several years, contracting it out. It's the same company we had. They've done other stuff they've done. Yeah, they've done. I think done. in the past they've done some of our regular landscape maintenance on one side of town or the other, back and forth, I think, yeah, for a I few years. I feel like they uh, did the tree, mer tree removal, but this is what they do during the winter time. I th you know what? And I think they did have this contract the year before last year. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. They've had it at different times, and I know that they, I believe right. that they've also done some of our regular landscape maintenance, yes. mowing and stuff in some either east side or west side or one year they did east side and one right. year they did west side. Mm -hmm. So they have done other work for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I, Laura mentioned to me before that we're also considering mm -hmm. looking at the options of with the way our uh, maintenance is set up now through public works that we may be considering bringing this in-house if we made investment in equipment and the employees that we have what would the differences be in costs if we did it that way versus going outside? Right. And I believe this is a Batavia company as well. And I did have questions. I think last year we went with a wheeling company, <laughs> or yeah. right? And I don't know if that worked out so yeah. well. Yep. Yeah. Uh, anybody else have questions? I know Scott and I talked about the the wild variation and some of the bids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and different parts of it. <laughs> Which yeah. I don't know yeah. if it, if it's you know they have to contract out if they have more snow than they can normally handle with their base equipment or what the differences are. But boy, there's some Slight, really strange numbers in there. <laughs> I think being local here makes a big difference. Yeah, on their true. response time and how fast they yeah. to get the job done. Yes. Well, I think if you look at the if you look at their quote, they're charging more for less snowfall. Cause that's what's going to happen more often. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where the others charge more for greater snowfall, but that's going to happen less often. So, mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions, comments? That I'll make the motion that we recommend to Council Resolution 19111R uh, authorization to execute a contract for 2019-2020 snow removal with Kozak Custom Landscaping Incorporated for an amount not to exceed seventy thousand dollars. Second. Motion by Wolf. Second by uh, Rosado. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Move right on to project status. Okay. I'm sure everyone is interested in hearing when the leaf and 
the upcoming leaf and brush pickup times are, so I'll just get that out of the way. Um, our brush pickup on the east side is actually happening this week, and on the west side will be on the week of October 21st. And leaf pickup starts October 21st on the east side, and the following week, October 28th, on the west side is our first um, leaf pickup. So you want to make sure that everything is out there on the Parkway by um, 7 o'clock a.m. And with regard to the leaves, they've got uh, Public Works now has some uh, really cool ability to show you where the leaves have been picked up and, and where they're heading to. So you can kind of keep track of their progress. Um, the city, in, along with Main Street and the Chamber of Commerce, plan to host a business a small business information forum on November 13th from 8 o'clock a.m. to 10 o'clock a.m. right here in Council Chambers. It's going to be an opportunity for our existing small business community as well as those who might be aspiring to locate a new business here in Batavia to teach them about topics that they'll want to know about as, um, as they either apply to, to bring their business here or to improve and grow their business. The topics that we will cover will include things like zoning and building codes, especially those that relate to fire and ADA, um, signage, liquor licensing, historic preservation, uh, parking, as well as um, and grant funding that might exist to help them out financially with any improvements that they are looking to make to the buildings in which they'll be located. And uh, we heard a couple really great examples tonight of how that money can be used. Um, as well, as part of the process, we're taking a look at the information that we have available online and try to make that easier to access um, for someone who is looking for small business information. So probably create a new landing page on our website to share information like that with our business community. Um, the the Raising Cane's restaurant uh, construction continues as well. They have posted a sign that they are now taking applications for employment. So this is looking more and more real all the time. It's a pretty good ruse. <laughs> But what does Facebook say? <laughs> also, the Oak and Swine Restaurant at 107 East Wilson is now open for business. They opened this Monday, and I wasted no time in <laughs> getting over there to, to yeah. check them out. And yummy. <laughs> I loved it the tacos that I had. They've got pork and they've got brisket and they've got salmon tacos, which are outstanding. So wish them much luck. Um, in public works, the water service and sump pump connections in area three are being connected this week. Uh, also, we've begun the engineering study for the carriage crest area to try to solve some of the drainage issues that are going on over there. And crews are nearing completion of the final connections to the new station transformer that's being installed at the Northeast substation. And final testing is scheduled for the next few weeks. And also one of uh, a major project for us over the course of the last year and a half to two years has been impl implementation of our ViewWorks program. Not only is it um, asset management software that allows all of our assets to be contained in one system. It's also a means of tracking the work of the city, multiple departments, and um, having all that information in one system is very powerful. So all divisions met um, this past week to review the status of the ViewWorks implementation to address any of the final issues um, kind of after having kicked the tires on the system. Uh, what we plan to do next is there is a um, resident facing portion of this system. So late this year, early next year, we'll be implementing, I guess you'd call it a 311 system where uh, when residents identify a situation that needs to be addressed, they will have an electronic means of filing that request for service. And also we'll be tracking in the system um, how our response is to those uh, type of inquiries. I also wanted to take note that on um, Saturday, the 26th of October, 
the Batavia Police Department in conjunction with the Department of Justice and Drug Enforcement Administration is hosting a Take Back Prescription Drugs Day. Um, this will be from 10 a.m. to 2 o'clock p.m. We always have a receptacle in our police um, front reception area there where individuals can bring in their prescription drugs and safely dispose of them. But according to the 2017 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, 6 million Americans misused controlled prescription drugs, and the study shows that most abused prescription drugs were obtained from family and friends, um, mostly older medications that weren't being used that people had just not disposed of. And it isn't safe to just flush those things down the toilet or to dump them down the drain or to throw them in the garbage where they end up in landfills because then they hit our you know, wastewater treatment facility and, um, and need to be cleaned out of the system that way. The safest way is to find one of these um, receptacles. And what you do is you have a baggie that will contain the medicine that you're wanting to dispose of, take it out of the packaging that has your name and address on it, Put it all together in the same bag. It doesn't matter what it is. Bring it to the police department, and they will show you how to put it into, um, into the collection. And that is taken off-site for um, proper destruction. Uh, that's all I have, unless anybody has any questions for me. Alderman Ewer. I have two questions on things you brought up. So with ViewWorks, you talk about how you'd be able to see response time to fixing things. Mm -hmm. It would be fascinating to see if they supply information that would show how we compare to other municipalities that are using ViewWorks. Mm -hmm. And then you would I'll actually have that. a metric that we could mm -hmm. say whether or not we're short staffed or overstaffed mm -hmm. in certain areas. Um, the second thing was on brush collection, since you brought that up. Yes. Um, we had talked in the spring about I get complaints from a lot of residents around us, large trees that hate that they have to wait. A long time before they can put out their brush um, and I'd like to bring up that discussion again about when we actually start brush collection in the spring that sounds good I'd prefer for Gary um, and or Scott to be here for yeah, that absolutely yeah, I'm not saying tonight yeah I'm saying yeah <laughs> at a future meeting that we discuss that because it would be helpful in some sections of town sure thing yeah, well, I got a couple your honor yeah, I'm uh, very pleased to report to you that uh, this past week in Chicago at the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, uh, we went through quite a letting in there with uh, the, the federal government came in and changed the rules on, on federally awarded projects. And if you were a city who had been granted a project and you had five years and you hadn't gotten it started, the feds came in and took the money right off the table and said your project is dead. So one major city in the area lost like 46 projects because they had asked for a lot of money and they didn't get it spent. So the feds then combined that money with the current coming year appropriation and there was $196,532,000 on the table. So they asked for applications for this money to be spent with the idea that in the new way, if you get the grant from it, you got to start the work within two years or that gets swept off away from you. So of the 67 projects that were submitted, and Kane County submitted several, uh, one of them was ours, and uh, of the 67 that were submitted, 32 got funded, and one of them that did get funded was Batavia's intersection at Prairie and Wilson for stoplight, for traffic signals, and crossing railroad crossing gates. Oh, and so that will be, uh, we got to get it ready and we're going to have to, we got an 80% grant on it. So they're giving us a, awesome. a $1,780,000 roughly to help fund. And it's basically, you're, you're going to have to widen up, put in some turn bays and some other stuff that's going to be there. But that will be on our agenda here in the next year as we begin conversations about it and engineering and everything else. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to share with you is I've, I've uh, spent the week uh, talking to our f friends around here that supply us with cable TV. Because if you walk into all these senior living communities that we have in the city of Batavia, I keep getting this, hey, mayor, 
what happened? Now the Cubs have been taken off of WGN. <laughs> what channel am I going to be watching next year to watch the Cub game? I mean, I went in the homestead the other two weeks ago, Saturday, I guess it was, and I got nailed against the wall about five times <laughs> by residents up there wanting to know what channel are they going to be on, how much is it going to cost. So I got on the phone and I called all the various folks, and I talked to Chris Nelson from Comcast, and he's governmental affairs or something is his role. Well, he tells me that Comcast is trying hard to put something together, but the Cubs are not proving to be a, a real interesting group of people to deal with as far as trying to get this done. So right now there are no contracts with the Cubs to put this out there. Uh, hopefully there will be. Uh, they're, they're continuing, and I guess AT&T has the same conversation going on with them. And as a result, uh, nobody knows exactly how much it's going to cost. And I think that's one of the items at the discussion table as to what the charge is going to be. Because as it was explained to me, it's an interesting thing to have because if you look at the baseball season, that may be seven months only. And then there's five months where you got to come up with something else to put on there. In the mar they think they're calling this the Marquee Channel or something like that. And... Uh, uh, there's some folks that have been buying a lot of stuff in Chicago, and they've bought this right with the Cubs and all this other great stuff. So more to come, but I want you, to, if you get asked, I'm surprised some of you haven't already heard about this, because there's a lot of constituents making noise about it. I was on a conference call in the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus Executive Committee this afternoon, and it came up. And I wasn't the only one that had been nailed against the wall about it. This is a kind of a regional question with everybody. All these Cub fans are really worried that they aren't going to be able to watch the game next year if we don't get something settled here. So, uh, so I guess Sox the, the Sox fans. The Sox, never, never. I'm happy. The, the Sox have made a deal sport. with NBC or something, right. and they, they've, got a, they've got it all tied up. Rather watch and, but the Cubs are, are <laughs> going in some new direction that the Yankees tried, and supposedly yeah. they've yeah. got a great thing going. But I think there's going to be a little bit of money – assessment on the fee of your cable subscription if this gets brought into the mix. Or people aren't going to watch it and then their yeah. revenues are going to go way down. It's called Wurtz-itis in well, then I, and then it'll I, I don't know about that, fixed. but I, it's, you know, it's, it's a big, just so you know, it's a big heavy point right. of conversation if you walk into the senior living communities about where the Cubs going to be next year, and I don't have an answer, so I wanted you all to know that there is no answer right at the moment. I hope they're easier to watch next year than they were this year. Yeah. <laughs> Wherever they are. That's true. That's true. You won't have to worry about it in October. Yeah. Easy, smart. Wow. You're down 7 1. You're not going to have to worry about, about it after spot. tonight. Right. Oh. I know. Uh, just one other uh, before they head on down to Champaign. Uh, for their final performance uh, next Wednesday, uh, the 23rd, the Batavia Community Marching Band. Uh, the Batavia Marching Band is putting on a community performance, excuse me, um, and uh, felt it was a good thing to, to plug and support and promote because uh, they're also doing a fundraiser yeah. uh, for Ronald McDonald uh, Children's, uh, excuse me, Charities uh, for the uh, Batavia High Schooler that passed away recently. So. When Come on out and support. Next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Yeah, and we'll make sure we bring that up again on Monday night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, don't let us forget that. I, so that's one thing I didn't get written like down. A convoy of buses down there? And to Champagne? Yeah. Oh, I haven't heard about the Champagne trip yet. Because, I mean, you know, we when the football or yeah. basketball right. team go, we bring out the fire truck and exactly. we yeah. them down yeah. to Muzart and Randall. We should do it for the band, too. Absolutely. And We've agree. done it for a bunch of other teams, well, we not just the football. Yep. So. Feel bad if we didn't do it for the band if they want, that, want us to do it. That's good. I agree. I think we can make that happen. Marty? Speaking of cable companies, <laughs> Metronet again? Again. What's going yeah. on? We're hearing complaints. And I know uh, Joe even mentioned that he was having some problems. That's a moment. Daily, Feel free to bring anything specific to our attention right. and we um, pass that along to. Um, Metronet. I understand that their area supervisor um, is no longer with them, so they had a change in personnel. So if it's the, uh, in reference to the one email that I was copied on, yeah, there was that that kind of got dropped in the transition with the individual who was leaving. Was it the one but he from was contacted this Friday? Today. And that's the one from Weaver Landing. 
That's the one where I've had Marsh. the most complaints from, and that was um, John Kowal's yeah. yes. email. Yeah. That's Weaver Landing, mm -hmm. and that's pretty bad out there. I went out and drove through that, and there's also a couple other. I'm trying to think where the last one was. Yeah, and Joe, was I think it was actually was back over by your house, <laughs> yeah. Elliot. That was still not fixed. It, there's a couple of properties in my ward that are still not resolved. Their issues, yeah. Yeah. There's a uh, there's some work that was done in front of H.C. Storm School, went down Van Nortrick to North Avenue, and I guess it was running some kind of a wire over to the... That's uh, what? That's our electric utility. Well, we, we didn't get it apartment. cleaned up very quickly, and the PTO over there got a little bit excited yeah. with me. So uh, <laughs> I, I was by there today, and they, they were out there redoing things and putting it back, so... I'm going back tomorrow to check and see how we're doing with that because there was uh, some things that weren't really done right, it looked like, as far as getting all the dirt back in and sod on top of it and everything else. It's a major project over there replacing some of the infrastructure that goes to the Lorland Apartments. Right. We were experiencing mm -hmm. some um, more frequent outages than we would like in that area. So it's been a couple of weeks project. Right. It's been kind of a project too, getting just some of the structures repaired that they've damaged as well. So mm -hmm. there were some holes right next to the sidewalks there on Van Nortrick where the kids are all walking to the school and several of them. I went over there to be in the walk to school day and I got my education from some of the moms <laughs> there about the holes in the ground and everything else. So I, I was what, over there. I've been over there every day other than when I was gone for a couple of days, just checking it out. I got to know everybody over there in Van Nortrick. We're all good friends, and it's uh, been an interesting experience. But uh. Anybody else have any others? Well, um, since Mr. McQuillan brought it up tonight, where are we with the logo? I know there's been some meetings. Sure, I can. Do you want to address Great. I'll address it then. Uh, so we have met as a committee. Um, we have given some direction to Griffin and his Chris. and Chris, right? Um, they are working on some new uh, iterations that they will bring to us, hopefully in by early November. So we are moving along, cautiously optimistic. And statistically significant consensus. Yes. Yeah. So. I think it's close. Anybody else? Mark, do you have none? Just two quick things. Probably should have asked Marconi when he was here. When he was here. Who's responsible for the cl clock at Wilson and Batavia Avenue? We have a nice clock that says Batavia on it, and it doesn't work. That's Marconi's. Is it? I figured. I, missed him. I know. <laughs> um, He'll be back Monday. Yeah. Be, that's yeah. <laughs> Gra grass is cheaper than blacktop. Yeah. We can have him fix the clock, too. <laughs> yeah. Actually, studies Wind have shown... Clock. Studies have shown since it's not digital, nobody can read it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Another millennial. It's right twice a day. <laughs> Tattooed millennials will never be able to read it. I have three broken clocks right. in my house. They're all. Um, the second one, who's responsible for the gazebo um, right in between Mobile and um, Newton House? I don't know. Because the banners, the red, white, and blue banners, look awful. Mm. I was stuck at the traffic light and glanced over there. And they look horrible, so it'd be nice if somebody... I think my boss donated those when they put that up, <laughs> so I don't think they've ever been replaced. That was the Lincoln Highway Association. Right, yes. and I, think, I actually think my boss donated those. <laughs> did that. Maybe you can know, donate them again. And that was when it that was, was built. a long time ago. Yeah. So they might be still the original ones there. <laughs> Looks like it. I'll ask them tomorrow morning who did that. Then you're going to have a ticket. <laughs> yeah, I won't do it. He'll do it. Yeah. I, have one, I have one more other. Kind of personal just to ask everybody to uh, visit the Batavia Arts Council website. Um, I got coerced into being a Halloween hooligan this year okay. along with my friend Dave Lundborg for BATV and it's HalloweenHooligans.com. I'm trying to get something together to put up on the screens on Monday night about it but we're lagging a little bit behind the other ones that are there and we're trying to raise money and just to tease you, there's three things that we could be dressing up for. One is the Blues Brothers, which I'm totally fine with. The other one is um, Sherlock Holmes and Watson. And the third one that's actually in the lead right now is Minions. Yes. So, so oh. which one don't you like? Uh, minions. Okay. <laughs> now, would you have the one eye or the And $100. And, and anybody that feels like donating for that, it's really cool. And then whoever yeah. wins it, 
actually gets another 10% for their charity as, or their whatever they're raising money for, and ours is for BATV. Oh. Of course, that's what we want to raise money for, so it would be for BATV. And uh, we're only at $155, and I think the leader right now is at like 500 so hmm. whatever you could do would be great. And, uh, yeah, I guess I'll dress up as a minion if I have to. And that'll happen that in happen? a couple of weeks. Um, let me see if it's listed on the website here. I think it's on the 26th. And, yeah, I'll make sure that there's pictures of it. If uh, our friend from the north, Mayor Burns, can come and do probably the worst rendition of our fight song ever done, and um, even worse than what I would sing it as. Um, he didn't know the it, words. Or, right, and I... He came up into the That's booth to visit with us to try to find you before the game. So it was. Quite, I was standing down there in the I, field. I know it was, <laughs> it was quite interesting. I think he just wanted to come up and be in the booth for a minute. <laughs> if there are no other others, yes, one more. Yes. Is garbage pickup delayed one day this week due to Columbus Day? Is it on the website? Because <laughs> that's where all the delays are on the website. Okay. I don't. I don't think. I don't think Columbus Day qualifies. What? I, I, don't, I don't think I don't it think is. So. I don't think so. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And honestly, what's on the website, every time pretty, I try to find it and yeah. tell somebody, that's always been okay. right. Yeah. Yeah. So get get your garbage out tonight. Yeah. <laughs> don't forget. Get it out. Alderman Silvani. I move we adjourn. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night. Have a good night. They're down 7-1 oh, in the fourth. Your response sounded like a typical Facebook response when people put that out there. And somebody's like...